Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today to talk about uh, immuno-oncology in uh, triple negative breast cancer. We have uh, an exciting program where we're going to be covering some of the basic biology of the immune response uh, to triple negative breast cancer, covering some of the clinical data, particularly how it uh, pertains to uh, surgeons treating triple negative breast cancer, and then uh, some discussion about the future and how we can potentially make um, breast cancers more immunogenic and expand the efficacy of immunotherapy uh, for our patients. Uh, we have uh, an incredible group uh, that's joining uh, me today. My name is George Pletus. I uh, am from New York at Sloan Kettering. I am uh, a surgeon um, and I also uh, study uh, lymphocytes from cancers in the lab. And I'm joined today uh, by Dr. MacArthur from Cedar sinai who is a medical oncologist and has done some incredible clinical and uh, uh, clinical translational work uh, in uh, breast cancer. And also by Dr. Ho from Mass General, who is a radiation oncologist and also has done uh, and continues to do some pretty exciting work integrating uh, radiation uh, with immunotherapy. And we're going to hear a lot more about that in a little bit. So this, uh, this session today will have two parts. The parts. There's a didactic part and then a, a practical part where we'll go over uh, some questions and have a discussion re related uh, to uh, audience member uh, interactions. So this is uh, my part of the talk. And what I wanted to cover today was uh, some of the background of the immune response to breast cancer and really why we believe that triple negative breast cancer in particular, it can be considered an immunogenic cancer. For a long time, uh, breast cancer has not been considered a particularly immunogenic cancer, but as we learn more about the biology of the various subsets of breast cancer, it becomes clear that triple negative breast cancers stand out. And I wanted to go over some of the data uh, that suggests this to be true. Um, and the first thing to realize is that the tumor microenvironment is, is not just tumor cells. It's a very complicated uh, environment that can be largely composed of normal host cells that are driven to have certain biologies uh, by the cancer cell, which drives this niche. And there are very, very interesting aspects of the tumor microenvironment that are, are being understood uh, through uh, various labs that are studying this. And while we would love to talk about all of these today, I'm going to focus on the immune compartment, uh, which is composed of innate immune cells, such as um, NK cells and um, dendritic cells, uh, various antigen-presenting cells. Um, there are adaptive immune cells, the T cells and B cells, and then the myeloid compartment, such as macrophages and monocytes derived by, by the uh, bone marrow. And one interesting thing is that uh, immunologists will often think of, of these uh, cells as very sort of discrete, highly polarized entities. But as we study cancer more and more, we realize that it is incredibly complex. Um, and this could be evident both when you look at cancers through uh, transcriptomics. And so we're all familiar with the sort of Lehman characterization of triple negative breast cancers into various um, transcriptomically defined subsets. These have been further defined here by the uh, Baylor subset. And again, in re repeatedly, you will find that even when we're talking about transcriptomics uh, or other metrics of investigating the biology of triple negative breast cancers, the immune response always pops up because it, it is very relevant uh, to the biology of triple negative breast cancers. And here you can see that the two major subgroups of uh, triple negative breast cancers as as described by gene expression, include the basal immune activated and the basal immune suppressed. And these subsets, subsets are largely defined by the presence of genes related to the immune system. Some things like cytokines uh, or various activation molecules that could be on, on immune cells. And when they're present in the tumor microenvironment and they're picked up by the gene expression assays, these are called basal immune activated. And when they're not, and so they're suppressed or they're not there, it's the immune suppressed subset. And this, this is actually clinically particularly relevant because again, 
Another theme that we'll notice as we go through these presentations is that the immune response is highly prognostic for these cancers. It dictates outcome, whether it be the natural history of the disease or its response to therapy uh, can be debated, debated, but nonetheless, it is important prognostically. And so the basal immune activated has the best prognosis and the basal immune suppressed has the worst. And this is a recurring theme. The more of an immune response you have, the better outcome. And so transcriptomics has, has revolutionized the way we think of triple negative breast cancers. And this, of course, has led to many targeted approaches, uh, immunotherapy for the immune activated as a hypothetical approach, and then providing immunotherapy combinations for the immune suppressed to augment immune responses, such as radiation, which we'll hear uh, later on. And in, not surprisingly, uh, as complex as the transcriptomics are, the genomics are also very complex. And uh, when you look at the various subsets of triple negative breast cancer as described by gene arrays, you can see uh, various alterations that uh, correlate with the different um, subsets. And the classic preponderance of p53 mutations is there. But what also is uh, here is varying degrees of the presence of mutations or non-synonymous mutations. And this also has been shown to be correlative with immune response and also potentially predictive of response to immunotherapy. And this you can see varies across the different subsets. And this is much higher in triple negative breast cancers than it is for other subsets of uh, breast cancer. And so this is another sort of um, example of how uh, various types of interrogations of triple negative breast cancers kind of come back to the immune response. And so Equally as complex and probably even more complex is the immune response uh, to breast cancer. And this, uh, this is coming to light in, in relatively recent uh, times as we have gotten better at interrogating uh, immune cells in tumors. And so we have started from a very simplistic uh, categorization of immune cells using just kind of standard immunohistochemical approach or flow cytometry with limited uh, parameters to a point where we can do single cell RNA sequencing. Um, and this is fairly common and relatively standard these days. And when you do this on tumors uh, from uh, patients with breast cancers, this is an example uh, of such an experiment, you can see that there's enormous complexity. And so this is a T-SNE reconstruction of single cell RNA sequencing from TILs or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes from a tumor from normal breast tissue from a lymph node and blood. And basically the colors here or the clusters are populations with discrete uh, transcriptomic phenotypes. So they're very particular uh, biologically distinct cells. And you can see how much more complicated this map is for tumors. There, there's a huge heterogeneity in the immune response um, in tumor versus normal. And you can see how simplistic blood is. Um, and on a practical level, you think of uh, T cell responses as being fairly classical, Th1, Th2. Well, when you do something like this, you can find 38 different T cell clusters, 15 of which are CD8, 21 of which are CD4. So it's highly, highly complex. And the problem here is that when we try to interrogate a single person's tumor by relatively simplistic methods, such as uh, a standard panel looking at CD4 or CD8s, uh, we, we lose a significant amount of the underlying complexity. And hopefully in the future, as, as assays like this can become more commonplace and less expensive, we can start to get a better understanding of uh, it, an individual's uh, immune response. However, what we do currently, for the most part, is something like this. And this is how we uh, assess an immune response on a clinical level in, in, in uh, pathology specimens from human breast cancers, which is basically just an H&E stain. And TILs, or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, are little blue dots, mostly in the stroma of an H&E section. And so this is an example of a uh, slide from a patient who has a dense uh, infiltrate of immune cells, and you can see a lot of blue in the stroma here between the nests of the, uh, the tumor cells. And then on the right side of the screen, you see a tumor that's largely devoid 
of immune cells. And so there's a lot of pink there and not a lot of blue. And this would be by some people's measure a cold tumor, meaning there's not much of an immune response, whereas on the left would be a hot tumor and there's a significant immune response. But it's often not so dichotomous. And in, actually, in, ac in actuality, the immune response is more of a continuum across different samples. And so when you're looking at a large data set, uh, a, large data, a large sample of tumors, you'll see that there's a very large spread. It ranges from tumors that have very little uh, immune response to a huge immune response. And these tumors, some of them, there can be more immune cells than there are actually tumor cells. And so when the stroma is occupied by greater than 50% of the area by lymphocytes, these are called lymphocyte predominant cancers. And so you can think about the the spectrum when you study TILs in two ways. You can think of it as a continuous variable. And some studies, some um, research studies will look at this as a continuous variable, or you can think of it as a dichotomous value and variable and just pick a cutoff like 20 to 30%, which is often used. So other than TILs varying by frequency, which they can uh, significantly, they can also vary by location. And so this is, uh, a diagram uh, from a review article where you can see uh, diagrammatically the various places where uh, tumors can have lymphocytes. There could be peritumorable lymphocytes, which are basically lymphocytes that are kind of surrounding the mass of the tumor. These are um, often thought to be actively excluded from the tumor. There can be stromal uh, immune cells where the immune cells are within the sort of uh, matrix of uh, the tumor mass within which there are clusters of epithelial tumor cells. And so the stromal immune cells are in the stroma around these nests of epithelial cells. And then there can be intratumoral um, lymphocytes where you actually have the lymphocytes intermixing with the tumor cells. And there is significant variability within which triple negative breast cancers have these uh, lymphocytes located in, in, uh, in the tumor microenvironment. However, the majority of tumors, if they do have an immune response, the immune cells are located in the stroma. And so here in this chart is an analysis of a large adjuvant chemotherapy trial, which they went back and looked uh, at the surgical specimens. And you can see that for triple negative breast cancers, um, there is about 10% of uh, the tumors that are lymphocyte predominant, where more than 50% of the stroma are, is occupied by immune cells. However, more of the tumors are associated with stromal tills rather than intratumoral tills. And really there's a small fraction of the tills that are located there within the nests of the tumor cells. Um, and as far as the studies go that look at the prognostic value of tills, it's clear that um, the, the stromal tills end up being uh, more important. So um, why is this relevant? So we hypothesize that the immune response to triple negative breast cancer is clinically relevant. And, and that hypothesis is because of how we think of what the immune system does to cancer. And so this is the classic cancer immunity cycle, and it outlines a series of reactions that occur between the host and the tumor which in the end we hope leads to a protective response. And I just wanna take a minute to go through this sort of cycle because there's a lot of important concepts to understand here. And the first step is that at some level, a tumor becomes immunogenic. And what that means is that while our immune systems are trained not to recognize self to prevent autoimmunity, they are trained to recognize something as foreign. And so we think that there are antigens within tumors um, that are able to activate the immune system. And a lot of these have been mapped out as something called neoantigens. And so there are mutations that cause proteins that are original or, or new to the immune system. And these can be detected by um, T cells and even antibodies from B cells. And that initiates an immune response. And that immune response for it to, to sort of come to fruition needs to go through a number of steps. These antigens need to be picked up by antigen presenting cells. And so these are cells like dendritic cells that monitor uh, their environment looking for new antigens. 
And when they find these antigens, they can present them through major histocompatibility molecules um, to the effector cells, which are um, T cells or B cells. Um, and this has to be done in an appropriate context. The antigen presenting cells need to be inflamed in a certain way or activated in a certain way. So context is important. Um, and when that context is appropriate and the appropriate co-stimulation is there, the T cells uh, can become activated to recognize this new antigen. And in the process of activation, they acquire properties that allow them to seek out the area from which this antigen came through. And so this antigen priming step is thought to happen in the lymph nodes. The T cells get activated. They get the ability to traffic back to the tumors. To do this, they need to be able to go through various layers like endothelial cells to go into the tumor stroma. And there, the T cells uh, can actually recognize these antigens that should be presented by cancer cells, largely through MHC class one, if it is present. And this can lead to a response whereby these T cells can then kill the cancer cells. And so the end result here is that the cancer cells get killed by the immune response. And so what is the evidence that this is occurring in triple negative breast cancers? And I'd like to go through a couple of, of steps uh, or, or avenues of, of evidence to suggest that this was true. One is, how does this play a role in the natural history of breast cancer and the response to therapy, either chemotherapy or immunotherapy? So unfortunately, there is not a whole lot of data on the outcome of triple negative breast cancer without the function of treatment. And so this is a relatively small study of, of, uh, of a sort of multi-center, multinational uh, collection of retrospective samples from uh, various institutes, relatively small numbers. But basically what they did is they went back and they assessed the till frequency, the, the amount of stromal tills in their samples. And they basically looked at outcome based on the degree to which the tumors were infiltrated. And again, the, like I mentioned before, uh, many of these studies look at this as a continuous variable. And so they will report data as a continuous variable. And so for every 10% increment in uh, tills, there is a corresponding change in hazard ratio, right? And so for, for this uh, study here, the hazard ratio for every 10% increase in tills improves by 0.93. And so it's a modest effect, but nonetheless, it shows you that tumors that have lymphocytes do better than those that don't. And this is outside of the, of the effect of treatment because these, these are untreated patients. Of course, this is going to be a highly selective group. Why didn't they get treated? Are they older patients? What have you? But nonetheless, it's, it's, a, very, uh, it's a, a small study, but one of the few studies that we have that looks at this very specific question. And these are some of the estimated survival uh, plots, this time looking at a dichotomous value. So looking at this 30% cutoff, and you can see that the tumors that have higher level of tills or greater than 30% uh, do better uh, than those that have lower than 30%. I will also draw your attention to the sort of fraction of tumors here that actually have uh, greater than 30%. And you'll see that it's it, the relative minority in this group, it's about a third or less. Uh, of the total group. So most, most samples will not be abundantly infiltrated uh, by lymphocytes. But nonetheless, this data does suggest that this active immune response is somehow impacting the natural history of this disease in a good way. Now, what about with adjuvant chemotherapy, right? And so there have been a number of studies that looked at this. Uh, this is one study, a combined analysis of these two um, adjuvant chemotherapy trials over 500 samples. And again, what they find is that when you look at the variable as a continuous variable, there is this continuous increase uh, or uh, improvement in outcome as there's increase in stromal till. And so large follow-up in this study, for every 10% increment in stromal till, there was a 14% reduction in the risk of recurrence or death an 18% reduction in the risk of distant recurrence. These are again, all triple negative breast cancer patients. And so this is 
uh, highly statistically significant and it's an independent variable. It maintains in multivariate analysis. Um, and you can see the survival curves here, uh, the continuous nature, right? And so the best outcomes are associated with the 50 to 80% stromal tills and the worst are where there's no stromal tills. And you can see the, great, the variations between those two. Now, that is uh, one study. Here's a study of a much larger group, uh, over 2,000 patients from nine adjuvant trials. And again, you see that there's this robust linear relationship between an increase in TILs and disease-free survival with the hazard ratio here for every 10% uh, increase in stromal TILs being uh, 0.86. And you'll see that this is better than it was in that small group of untreated patients. So that it suggests that there is an interaction with treatment as well, and not just the natural history of disease. And this is actually so reproducible and robust that you can even translate this on an individual patient level. And you can go on a website at uh, tillsandbreastcancer.org and you can take an individual patient's data, um, some very basic demographics, and uh, the algorithm will generate a survival curve that will show you the predicted survival or whatever other metric you'd like of an individual patient based on the uh, stromal tills. And this a uh, review article here that you can uh, look at uh, for the uh, description of uh, this type of nomogram. So this is a study from the uh, German breast cancer group looking at uh, over 900 triple negative breast cancer patients as well as other uh, subsets, but there were, was good sampling of triple negative breast cancer. And you can see in this uh, uh, plot here that the patients who had a high degree of infiltration or lymphocyte predominant cancers had a significantly higher uh, complete pathologic uh, response rate than those that were uh, less infiltrated. And this, of course, as we saw with the adjuvant chemotherapy, translated uh, to uh, improved outcomes. So TILS ends up being one of the best predictors we have to, for response to neoadjuvant uh, uh, chemotherapy. And interestingly enough, even in the patients who do not have a complete pathologic response, where there is still residual tumor, the TILS continue to be prognostic. And so that if you look at the residual immune cells within the the uh, mass that's remaining within the residual disease, those are further predictive of outcome. And this is a graph that shows uh, residual tumors that have uh, high till versus low till, and you can see the dramatic difference in metastasis-free survival. But what's also interesting is that there is a change of where the immune cells are located. And so that the chemotherapy is doing something to the tumors where you're having a greater degree of intratumoral lymphocytes present. And, and that is very interesting because we often think of chemotherapy as potentially being a, a mechanism by which we can make tumors more immunogenic. Now, why would this be the case? Why would, why would TILs be predictive of chemotherapy response? Well, that isn't entirely clear, but there was one study out of Yale, which is, uh, which is uh, very interesting, it was published a few years ago in JAMA Oncology, which basically uh, took a, a simple approach. What they did was they looked at gene expression data as well as genomic data from triple negative breast cancers, um, and they correlated a gene expression profile that was associated with a, a immune response to the degree to which tumors were sort of somatically or genomically complex, right? And so how heterogeneous they were uh, genomically, either through looking at clonal heterogeneity through this uh, score that they developed or just purely looking at somatic copy number alterations. And one thing, one thing they find is that there's an inverse relationship. The higher degree to which the tumors uh, manifested an immune signature, the less complex they were the lower the degree there were present somatic copy number alterations or clonal heterogeneity. And this potentially would make sense from a chemotherapy response 
perspective in so much that uh, if you have simpler tumors, you may have clones, less frequent clones that could be chemo resistance, but it also provides a thinking that the immune system is actively editing tumors and potentially even editing out chemo resistant clones. And so that making a tumor immunogenic through various potential means might actually augment even the response to chemotherapy. And so this um, intersection between uh, genomic heterogeneity and uh, immune response is very interesting. And I think it will be a fruitful avenue of research moving forward. So it's very clear that there's a um, correlation between uh, standard chemotherapy and uh, immune response. Well, what about making this immune response better? Can we augment it with immunotherapy uh, to sort of whatever happened in the beginning that didn't allow that tumor to be eradicated, can we reverse that, right? And so this is the concept of immunotherapy. And currently the, um, the major sort of focus of uh, immunotherapy is on checkpoint blockade uh, or specifically targeting uh, these, uh, this pathway called the PD-1, uh, PD-L1 uh, pathway. Now, the one sort of concept that is helpful to understand um, the context within which immunotherapy works is that the immune system evolved to do two things. It evolved us to protect uh, against foreign pathogens, viruses and bacteria, um, but as it evolved to do this, it got increasingly complex and increasingly more powerful. And during that evolution, there had to be mechanisms in place to prevent sort of aberrant damage, so autoimmune responses, to protect against reactivity against self, but also mechanisms to curtail immune responses, to turn them off, because collateral damage from a very potent immune response could be... Um, detrimental to a host. And so mechanisms evolved to sort of prevent that from happening. And what's interesting is that these mechanisms seem to be recapitulated in the tumor. And so that these, um, the ways that the immune system turns off an immune response or the way that immune system protects against autoimmunity are found within tumors. And so, for instance, um, there's a subset of T cells known as regulatory T cells, and they're critically important for preventing autoimmunity, and, and they're necessary for survival. And if you look inside of tumor, they're full of regulatory T cells. And so that the tumor is co-opting this normally occurring uh, mechanism of preventing autoimmunity to protect itself against uh, immune uh, attack. And similarly, pathways that curtail an immune response or prevent collateral damage um, are also co-opted. And so this is where this idea of checkpoint blockade comes into play. When you have a T cell that's activated, it can potentially go on to produce a tremendous amount of inflammation. And so there are programs in place that at the beginning of activation, there are checkpoints that go up that limit the immune response to that T cell so that it can turn off once it's done its job. And these, there's two classic ones that have been well studied. One is the CTLA-4 pathway and the other one is the PD-1 pathway. And so once T cells get activated, they upregulate this uh, receptor called PD-1. And when this receptor sees its ligand, PD-L1 or PD-L2, in the environment within it is, either it could be in the setting of a viral infection and uh, the virally infected epithelial cells can express PD-L1 to turn off the T cell response, or it could be in the setting of a tumor where a tumor cell expresses PD-L1, which binds PD-1 on the T cell and essentially turns it off. And so again, this is not in any way tumor specific. This is a normally occurring uh, mechanism that protects us against our, our own immune system, but it's co-opted by a tumor. And so this became uh, very clear as a potent mechanism of T cell suppression within the tumor microenvironment. And that if you 
when you take an antibody and you disrupt this interaction, and so you don't allow PD-1 to see PDL1, then you alleviate the suppression, and the T cell then can be continued, continued to be activated and kill more tumor cells. And so uh, this idea of immunotherapy has, of course, made great uh, waves in, in some cancers more than others. But one hypothesis that is often put forth is that you need to have potentially some sort of pre-existing immune response for this to work. There need to be T cells around so that when you take away the suppression, they'll be active. And so along those lines, it is likely that one, TILs in and of themselves, potentially could be a predictive biomarker to immunotherapy using the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway, but also the actual target itself, which could be PDL1 in antibodies that bind PDL1, if it's present, could also be a potential biomarker of response to immunotherapy. And so this uh, Keynote 173 trial was a phase 1b uh, study looking at neoadjuvant pembrolizumab with chemotherapy. And if you look at uh, the uh, distribution of complete pathologic responses, you can see that they are concentrated in uh, patients who have higher expression of PDL1 in their tumors. And so this is looking at PDL1 both on tumor cells and, uh, and, um, and stromal cells. Um, but you can see that if you look at these plots, it's not a perfect biomarker because there are um, uh, tumors that have very high levels of PDL1 that have PCR, uh, that get a PCR, but there are others that have almost no PDL1 that still have a PCR. So it's an imperfect biomarker, but it clearly concentrates a group of people that will respond. And similarly for TILs, you see the same um, pattern that there are. It is a biomarker. It can concentrate a group of patients who will have a complete pathologic response to neoadjuvant immunotherapy. However, it's imperfect because there are plenty of patients down here who had a complete pathologic response who've had very few TILs. So the biology doesn't add up entirely with what we're observing uh, clinically, but nonetheless, it is um, hypothesis generating that one, having the target around is important and that having a pre-existing immune response is important. So therapeutically, one could think that if you wanted to potentially increase the efficacy of immunotherapy, you could try to increase those things, figure out a way to get more lymphocytes into tumors and also increase the expression of PDL1 potentially. Um, the other important uh, um, um, example of this is in this uh, in the data that came from the Keynote 522 trial. This was a larger phase three trial looking at neoadjuvant pembrolizumab and chemotherapy. And what we could see here is that PCR rate is higher with immunotherapy, and we'll, we'll hear more of that uh, in a moment. Um, but the PDL1 status alone doesn't predict for benefit of this regimen. And so while patients who have PDL1 positivity in general have a greater degree, a greater likelihood of having a complete pathologic response if given immunotherapy, but even without immunotherapy, even chemotherapy alone, we can see that the PDL1 in and of itself in the patients in the placebo arm can find a group of patients that will have an increased rate of a complete pathologic response. And so there's more going on here than just the interaction with chemotherapy. These are biologically distinct tumors. And more often than not, these tumors will also be uh, lymph lymphocyte rich. They'll be densely infiltrated uh, by immune cells. So again, this, this idea that the immune response is not only predictive of therapy, but also potentially just predictive of natural history and outcome. But also of interest here is that in, even in tumors that didn't express the target PDL1, one uh, there was a significant improvement in complete pathologic response, although just at a lower level than um, that which we see in the PDL1 positive tumors. And so this is uh, this is another uh, example of of this. Uh, this is the uh, uh, another uh, randomized uh, uh, phase two study of neoadjuvant immunotherapy. This time, uh, duvalumab in chemotherapy again in triple negative breast cancers. And here they have again TILs as well as PDL1 uh, expression. 
in pretreatment biopsies, both in the placebo arm as well as in the uh, experimental arm. And again, you see this theme that um, even outside of the setting of immunotherapy, these parameters can predict response to therapy. So overall, we clearly need better biomarkers uh, to be able to figure out exactly who would benefit from, from immunotherapy. And I think that this is a, a, a big problem because most of our patients do not respond uh, and there are uh, notable side effects, which we'll talk about in a second. And to get to this answer or to at least get a better answer regarding biomarkers, we really have to try to understand uh, the tumor microenvironment as a whole and not just focused on these very sort of um, narrow windows of uh, TILs or just pd one expression. And we have to understand that T cells interact with various other factors within the tumor microenvironment and that, that as a tumor evolves, it will evolve various mechanisms of avoiding an immune response, which are gonna be outside of the realm of checkpoint blockade. And so why don't patients respond? Well, it could be that uh, that pathway was never important in, that, in their tumor to begin with, that they figured out another way to immune, invade an immune response. And this, you can almost, it's almost like getting ahead of us because the targets are actually outpacing the degree to which we understand their biology. And so this is a diagram from a recent review article and you can see all the various aspects of the tuber microenvironment that are being targeted uh, with therapies. And yet we still don't really understand, uh, even on a bulk level, but on a, ideally on an individual person level, on an individual tumor level, how each of these will play a role in that person's sort of immune state. And so we need significant more work with sort of high parameter analysis of tumors, both on therapy and off therapy to try to understand what the baseline mechanisms for each individual person are that leads to a suppression of an immune response, how that could be overcome. And also in patients where there really is no immune response, what we could do to generate a productive one. And so uh, I, I will uh, stop there and I will hand it over to uh, Dr. MacArthur who will take us through some of the uh, uh, clinical trials of immunotherapy and uh, triple negative breast cancer. Thank you, George, for that kind introduction. And thank you for including me in this terrific program. Today, I have the pleasure of describing for you the clinical data that we've gathered to date with immune therapy for the treatment of triple negative breast cancer. And I'd like to start out with the first FDA approval for immune therapy for triple negative breast cancer and that's a result of the Impassion 130 trial. This is a large randomized phase three trial in patients who had previously untreated or metastatic or inoperable breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer in good performance status. And they were randomized in the first line setting to receive NAB paclitaxel, so a chemotherapeutic that we commonly use for the treatment of metastatic breast cancer with either placebo or atezolizumab, the pdl one directed antibody. And we just heard from George why chemotherapy might be a terrific partner for immune therapy and enhance antigen presentation. So that was the hypothesis behind this study. When we look at the baseline characteristics, we see a few interesting features that are worth pointing out. The first is that approximately 40% of patients were deemed pdl one positive or their tumors were deemed pdl one positive by a specific assay the Ventana SP142 assay. And it's also worth noting that approximately 40% of patients had de novo metastatic disease. So they had not received prior chemotherapy in the curative intent setting. And that may uh, um, play a part when we look at the responses specifically. So when we look at the primary uh, progression-free survival analysis, there was a, a small improvement in progression-free survival from 5.5 to 7.2 months in the intention to treat population. And when we hone in on those 40% of patients or thereabouts who had pdl one positive tumors, we had a, saw a slightly greater improvement in progression-free survival from five to 7.5 months. 
there was a co-primary endpoint in this analysis. So increasingly we're seeing in metastatic trials that overall survival is being interrogated as a co-primary endpoint, because of course that's the thing that we care about having patients live longer. And when you look at the intention to treat population, there was no significant difference in overall survival between those treated with atezolizumab or placebo. However, in an exploratory analysis where they looked at overall survival in the PDL1 positive population, they did see a significant improvement in overall survival. So not statistically significant because it was an exploratory analysis, but a clinically impactful improvement from uh, 15.5 to 25 months. And this is disease where patients typically can expect to have a life expectancy of 18 to 24 months after diagnosis. So to see a nine and a half month improvement in overall survival with first line therapy was incredibly exciting. This data was subsequently updated at the following ASCO meeting with a uh, maintained seven month improvement in overall survival in the PDL1 positive subset. And this data led to the FDA approval in March of 2019 of atezolizumab in combination with NAB paclitaxel um, for patients who have PDL1 positive triple negative breast cancer. That's PDL1 staining tumor infiltrating immune cells of any intensity of at least 1% of the tumor area as defined by an FDA approved test. And again, it was the Ventana SP142 assay that was adopted in this trial. We've since seen data from another study. This is the Keynote 355 study, similar population, newly diagnosed metastatic or inoperable triple negative breast cancer. This is a first line therapy study where patients are randomized to receive chemotherapy or uh, chemotherapy rather with either pembrolizumab or placebo. In this study, patients um, could receive any number of chemotherapies, specifically paclitaxel or NAB paclitaxel or the combination of gemcitabine with carboplatin. So can immune therapy be effective with different chemotherapy backbones? And again, we saw co-primary endpoints of progression-free survival and overall survival, both in the intention to treat populations, but also in selected PDL1 positive subsets. In this study, 75% uh, of patients had tumors that were deemed PDL1 positive using a, a different assay that generates a combined positive score. So, as you'll recall in the Impassion 130 study, 40% of patients were deemed positive by that study here, 75%. But approximately 40% were strongly positive for PDL1 with a combined positive score greater than or equal to 10. About a third of patients in this study, or approximately 30%, had de novo metastatic disease. Most patients, or about half of the patients, had recurred more than 12 months from their initial diagnosis, so had a 12-month or greater disease-free interval. And here's the data for progression-free survival in the intention to treat population, 5.6 uh, to 7.5 month improvement in progression-free survival. And when they interrogated the PDL1 positive subsets, either, design, either defined as a combined positive score greater than or equal to one versus a combined uh, positive score greater than or equal to 10, the magnitude of that benefit was um, amplified, particularly for the combined positive score greater than or equal to 10. And so the overall survival data from this study are eagerly anticipated. We've also recently seen the report of a Keynote 119 study. This is a study uh, in patients who had one to two prior lines of chemotherapy. So historically response rates in that setting have been in the five to 10% range um, in this more heavily pretreated population. In this study, patients were randomized to receive pembrolizumab as monotherapy or investigators choice chemotherapy either capecitabine, aribulin, gemcitabine, or veneralbine. There was no overall survival difference in the intention to treat population or in the PDL1 positive population where po uh, positive was defined as combined positive score greater than or equal to one, or even the combined positive score greater than or equal to 10. However, when they looked at an even higher bar, so combined positive score greater than or equal to 20, so this was not 
one of the primary endpoints of the study, so this was exploratory, but they did see a more than two month improvement in overall survival in that subset, indicating that the amount of PDL1 positivity might uh, predict for responses to checkpoint blockade. What about checkpoint blockade in the curative intent setting? So our first signal that immune therapy had a potential role to play in improving cure rates for triple negative breast cancer came from the iSpy2 study. This is a study with an adaptive trial design. So it's not designed to look at various regimens head to head, but, in still, but instead it is designed to look for a signal of combination strategies that are most likely to be effective in a randomized phase three study. So one of the arms in iSpy2 allowed for co-administration of pembrolizumab with paclitaxel prior to anthracycline-based treatment in the neoadjuvant setting. And the addition of pembrolizumab to the chemotherapy backbone led to a threefold improvement in the estimated pathologic complete response rate. So the estimated pathologic complete response rate for the control arm was 20% and 60% for the experimental arm, giving us the first signal that immune therapy really had a potential role to play in curing women with triple negative breast cancer. More recently, we've seen the results of the Keynote 522 study. This is a study where patients received neoadjuvant chemotherapy with a taxane at platinum and an anthracycline-based regimen and they were randomized to receive either placebo or pembrolizumab together with that chemotherapy backbone. And those assigned to receive pembrolizumab also received pembrolizumab as monotherapy in the adjuvant setting. And what they saw was with the addition of pembrolizumab to the chemotherapy backbone, there was an improvement in pathologic complete response in the intention to treat population of 14%. And discordant with what we had seen in the metastatic setting, where PDL1 really enriched for responses, the benefit was seen regardless of PDL1 status. And in fact, the magnitude of the benefit was even slightly larger for the PDL1 negative subset, 14% versus 18%, respectively. So, this was very exciting data to see improvements in pathologic complete response because pathologic complete response has historically correlated with curability of disease. And we saw an early signal that this might be true with this strategy. So at the time of this presentation, we had only 15 months median follow-up. So this is very unstable data, but indicates that at 18 months, there's a 6% improvement in event-free survival. So as early as a year and a half after treatment, there is an improvement in cure rates. And so longer follow-up is highly anticipated. There was also a re recent report from the Impassion 031 study. This is a study looking at NAB paclitaxel as the taxane backbone followed by doxorubicin with cyclophosphamide and either atezolizumab or placebo, again in the neoadjuvant setting with those being assigned to atezolizumab receiving atezolizumab again in the adjuvant setting. And on Wednesday, June 17th, we received a press release stating that this study had met its primary endpoint by demonstrating a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in pathologic complete response for patients with early triple negative breast cancer, regardless of PDL1 expression. So the details of that study are very highly anticipated. A couple other neoadjuvant studies worth mentioning. The NeoTrip study was presented last year. This was a study looking at carboplatin with NAB paclitaxel, randomized to receive atezolizumab or not before surgery, followed by an anthracycline after surgery. And discordant from the two studies that I just showed you, the Impassion 030 and the Keynote 522, these investigators found no improvement in pathologic complete response in the intention to treat population, the PDL1 positive subset or the PDL1 negative subset. And it is unclear why these results are so discordant from the other studies, um, although uh, pathologic complete response was not the primary endpoint for this study. And so event free survival data from this study are very highly anticipated. The Gepar Nuevo study was a study looking at NAB paclitaxel followed by anthracycline with cyclophosphamide in the neoadjuvant setting and patients were randomized to receive that backbone 
with dervalumab versus placebo. And a subset of patients participating in this study actually received dervalumab as a run-in prior to initiating chemotherapy. And that's really important. I'll show you in a moment why. So they did not show a statistically significant difference in pathologic complete response, although there's a, a suggestion that maybe in, uh, pathologic complete response was improved in the Durvalumab group, but again, not statistically significant. But what was interesting in this study was that the patients who received the immune therapy before chemotherapy in this exploratory analysis had an approximately 20% improvement in pathologic complete response, which begs the question, does the timing of administration of immune therapy with respect to chemotherapy matter? And this study would suggest that perhaps it does. There are also some adjuvant studies that are ongoing to be aware of. SWOG 1418 is a study randomizing patients with residual triple negative breast cancer after their standard of care chemotherapy and surgery to receive pembrolizumab for a year versus observation. And that um, study has been accruing very briskly. There's also the Impassion 030 study, which randomizes women after surgery to receive adjuvant paclitaxel followed by cyclophosphamide and doxorubicin with atezolizumab versus not. So this asks the question, can you effectively treat micrometastatic disease in the adjuvant setting as we have seen successfully done in other tumor types, including uh, curable melanoma? Fantastic. Um, that was great and amazing <clears throat> how much has been accomplished in a relatively uh, short time. So uh, now we will turn it over to uh, Dr. Ho, who will tell us uh, what the future holds. Okay. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be um, participating uh, in this uh, presentation. Thank you, George, for organizing and inviting. I'm going, to speaking, I'm going to be speaking about new directions in local therapy approaches to expand the benefits of immunotherapies to more breast cancer patients. And I'll be specific, uh, specifically focusing on uh, radiation therapy and also touch upon uh, cryotherapy. So um, I'm sure that um, you've all heard that uh, radiation can augment the tumor immune response, and it can do that in a variety of ways. Um, it can facilitate antigen presentation. Uh, radiation can also prime and recruit T lymphocytes to the tumor stroma. Um, it can also directly induce PDL1 expression in the tumor and stromal cells. And um, I'll explain uh, what this abscopal effect is, but um, it can be possible to observe an abscopal effect when you combine radiation with immune checkpoint inhibitors. So there are a number of uh, outstanding questions when it comes to combining uh, radiation and immune checkpoint inhibitor optimally uh, for the treatment of breast cancer. But one of the main questions um, that we're trying to figure out here is what dose is optimal? And so uh, there's very convincing uh, preclinical data by Sylvia Fermenti and colleagues uh, at Cornell who've shown that a high dose, uh, such as eight gray times three, often given with stereotactic radiotherapy can be preferred. However, uh, in breast cancer patients who are receiving uh, this type of treatment in the curative intent setting, um, I'm sure we're all aware of the fact that um, oftentimes they'll have to continue on to receive more radiation in the adjuvant uh, space. And um, many, many, and even more breast cancer patients are um, surviving and quality of life and side effects become very important. So the question of whether we can uh, potentially uh, achieve equally uh, favorable and effective immune responses with lower doses of radiation have also been posed. And uh, we've seen that uh, in the preoperative space, um, there is some data lacking for what that optimal dose is. So uh, one of the first uh, clinical studies that evaluated the role of radiation therapy in combination with immune ch checkpoint blockade was the TONIC trial, which is a very creative um, phase two adaptive design type of trial that looked at a number of induction uh, induction therapies in metastatic triple negative breast cancer. 
And uh, the primary uh, endpoint here was to look at um, overall response rate. And the idea here was that um, the arms that had the best response uh, would be deemed the winners and, and that would be expanded into um, a larger study. Unfortunately though, uh, the radiotherapy arm here um, had a rather uh, d a disappointing response, ORR of 8% uh, relative to the overall, uh, the ORR of 20% in the entire cohort. And the clear winner here was um, declared the doxorubicin arm. So my understanding is that that is you know, currently ongoing, that expansion. But back to this radiotherapy arm, you know, why, uh, why so low when we had so much hope in what radiation could do? And of course, that's not something that's easy to answer, but again, you know, uh, it just brings us back to the prior slide where uh, we acknowledge that, again, the timing and sequencing of the radiation, um, as well as other uh, factors could be important variables here uh, in generating an immune response. Uh, so uh, that really, uh, following on the heels of that, um, was one of the uh, first studies uh, that uh, were performed uh, exclusively in a cohort of metastatic triple negative breast cancer patients with pembrolizumab and radiation therapy in metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So what we saw in the overall cohort uh, was that the ORR, which is defined as the change in tumor burden, again, outside of the radiation field, was observed in about 18% of the cohort, so three out of the 17. So that's about uh, what you would observe in the uh, pembrolizumab uh, or the um, um, checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy trials um, of those patients who are only pdl one positive. Um, now, we have to, uh, the, the caveat here with our study was that 50% uh, of the patients, because uh, they had very poor prognosis, um, were not evaluable. And so uh, that really left us about 50% of the population to evaluate uh, for response. And among those nine patients um, who remained uh, to be evaluated, we found that there were three responders. And, uh, what was impressive, though, was that uh, there was a 100% reduction in the tumor volume outside of the irradiated portal. And I will show you uh, this spider plot here, which I think really recapitulates um, the pattern that we see uh, with these uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor studies in breast cancer, which is that um, although we may not see uh, a, a vast number of responses, in those uh, that we are able to achieve uh, with these therapies, they tend to be uh, quite durable. And you can see that demonstrated here by this very long uh, leg of the spider graph, which represents uh, one of our three responders uh, who had a tremendous amount of uh, disease prior to treatment and had been treated with uh, many other therapies, including another type of uh, immune therapy and was uh, NED um, greater than 110 weeks um, after the treatment. And so um, here is just a demonstration of our first responder who received radiation therapy to a fungating uh, left breast mass and actually only had one cycle of pembrolizumab uh, secondary to um, elevation in, um, in bilirubin. Um, however, at 19 weeks, she was found to have a dramatic response in these uh, mediastinal lymph nodes as well as um, some satellite lesions uh, that were not in the irradiated portal. Uh, and this is the, our exceptional responder whose long spider leg uh, of the graph um, I showed you earlier, who had had uh, significant radiation with hyperthermia even uh, to a breast mass that was uh, really infiltrated with tumor as well as um, a lung tumor, which is uh, what she came to me uh, uh, to be irradiated. Um, and you can see that um, following treatment, uh, she had a dramatic uh, reduction in uh, this tumor. And for other reasons, um, you know, she developed uh, an infection and one went on to get surgery, uh, which unfortunately required uh, removal of this lung. And uh, it was remarkable in that there was uh, absolutely no evidence of tumor, um, which confirmed um, her NED status. 
So uh, when we started this out, you know, of course, uh, when you're combining these therapies and there's so much unknown, uh, just being able to have a good understanding of the tolerability and safety is important. And we found that uh, there were mostly grade one, two toxicities uh, observed with combining pembrolizumab and radiation, uh, mostly radiation dermatitis, which was attributed to the radiotherapy and certainly not the combination of the treatment. And uh, we saw very few grade three to five um, toxicities. And uh, these other ones were um, attributable to the pembrolizumab. So the lessons that we learned uh, was that uh, based on this small uh, study, the combination uh, with the dose and fractionation that we gave and the sequencing uh, that was proposed appeared safe and well tolerated. Uh, there was modest but encouraging activity in a heavily pretreated poor prognosis population of triple negative breast cancer, but we acknowledge that the small sample size limited really broad applicability. And as I said, although there were few, uh, these responses were very durable. And uh, it did appear that low volume metastatic disease and earlier line um, of therapy uh, was better and PDL1 positivity uh, appeared suggestive of response. Um, all three responders were PDL1 positive. And uh, with that, we knew that we needed larger, well-designed studies and better bi biomarkers than PDL1 in order to predict benefit with these um, immuno-oncology radiation therapy combinations. And then lastly, uh, this really um, generated the excitement and rationale to really um, look at these combination strategies uh, in the curative intent setting. So with that in mind, uh, that really um, stimulated um, a, a number of studies examining the combination of immune checkpoint inhibitor and radiation in the neoadjuvant or preoperative setting. And so um, one of the first ones um, that uh, were initiated and is now actually almost complete uh, was conducted by uh, my colleagues at Cedar sinai um, Dr. Shao and MacArthur, and while I was there, um, me. Um, and this was a pilot study of preoperative pembrolizumab and radiation therapy in HER2 negative early stage breast cancer patients, um, in which um, eight gray times three uh, was delivered um, preoperatively um, with one cycle of pembrolizumab. And then uh, that was followed by standard of care uh, preoperative treatment, whether that be neoadjuvant chemotherapy or surgery. And so uh, what was, what's been impressive, um, and these were, uh, you know, I, it's early stage here, but it turns out that uh, quite a few patients had pretty advanced disease. Um, in the uh, data uh, presented at ASTRO, um, as well as ASCO and San Antonio, the PCR rates uh, were actually pretty high in 71%. And so um, with uh, tremendous backing and funding, um, this study was expanded to 50 patients. And I'm told that um, it's doing quite well and is nearly complete. So we should be seeing some very exciting results from this study. Um, there's the Pandora study um, uh, run by Dr. MacArthur, um, which is uh, preparing to open. And this is a randomized uh, phase two study, which is looking at the combination of dervalumab with chemotherapy in triple negative uh, breast cancer uh, in combination with radiation. So this is a randomization to uh, radiation, um, no radiation. And um, uh, it'll be nice to see um, different results using uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors aside from pem pembrolizumab. Um, and then finally, there's the PRAD study, uh, which is run through the TBCRC uh, from, by myself and Gaurav Gupta, which is a randomized phase two study uh, looking at pembrolizumab uh, plus or minus no low or high dose radiation in specifically node positive, triple negative, or high-risk HR-positive breast cancer patients. And so um, uh, the focus of this study really is to look at that dose question that, um, that I mentioned earlier. And the co-primary endpoints here are pathologic nodal response, as all patients have to be uh, node positive to be eligible. And this should serve as a surrogate for abscopal effect, we hope. 
as well as um, looking at a change in tills as, an, as a second uh, primary endpoint. So the study paradigm, um, I'll, I'll just explain this to again, uh, really um, impress upon you um, the hope in this abscopal effect or the concept of it anyway. Um, all of these patients have a positive lymph node and the intact tumor is being irradiated to a, a very conformal field. And I will say here, um, you know, one idea that's, that's really uh, kind of taking force here is that we don't necessarily have to treat the entire tumor with high doses of radiation to generate a robust um, immune response with, um, with pembrolizumab. So we, you know, designed a lot of um, kind of mock treatment plans where um, we really focus that high dose in just parts of the tumor if the tumor is very large. Uh, with the hope of limiting um, toxicity at these, as these patients need to go on for uh, surgery later. And so the idea is that after uh, the, this SBRT of varying doses uh, with Pembro um, and after uh, the completion of Pembrolizumab, uh, which is continued with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, when patients go on to surgery, we're able to assess the uh, response in this positive lymph node. And so briefly, this is the schema. As I mentioned, there are two cohorts, triple negative and HR positive cohorts, where we'll look at various doses of radiation uh, compared against this control. And pembrolizumab is the IO agent, which is given uh, once uh, with um, the radiation. And uh, then six weeks later, um, it will continue on throughout neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And so, uh, a mandatory uh, biopsy of the irradiated tumor will be performed in order to assess uh, the TILs or any change in TILs uh, following the treatment. And the important thing here um, for the surgeons to note is, you know, the important clinical primary endpoint is really uh, surgical lymph node evaluation. So we're evaluating pathological nodal response. And so um, what uh, gets removed and how um, becomes um, extremely important. Um, so a bit more um, about the surgery um, on the trial for uh, surgeons. Um, definitive surgery will be performed three to six weeks after the neoadjuvant chemo, which is you know, pretty standard regardless of whether there's a trial or not. Um, either breast conserving surgery or mastectomy can be performed and reconstruction can be performed as per patient preference. Um, with uh, a number of surgeons from various institutions, we um, formulated um, some very careful guidelines on the management of the axilla um, as you know, uniform evaluation um, is really important in order to assess that primary endpoint uh, correctly. And as I've, I've come to understand, there's still quite a lot of heterogeneity in how the axilla can be um, um, managed uh, following new adjuvant chemo. So we do require that a clip in that positive lymph node um, needs to be placed prior to randomization. If there are multiple positive nodes that are biopsied, um, we recommend clipping the most abnormal appearing node uh, as opposed to the most accessible node. And a variety of techniques, sentinel node biopsy, targeted axillary dissection or axillary lymph node dissection or a combination can be performed. Um, importantly, uh, uh, it's required that uh, at least two sentinel lymph nodes, one of, what's, one of which must contain the clip, um, is required. Um, IHC evaluation of the sentinel nodes is required in order to confirm lack of occult disease, uh, whether that be micrometastases or ITCs in all YPN0 cases. And any residual nodal disease detected by sentinel lymph node biopsy or targeted axillary dissection, including micromets or macromets, requires a completion ax dissection. Uh, now we debated uh, what to do about um, residual ITCs in the nodes. And uh, the reality is, um, uh, you know, we acknowledge that although if we really wanted to be um, very uh, purist, we, we would require a completion ax dissection in those patients too, but uh, we, we recognize that that would be very hard to do um, in terms of convincing the patient what the benefit of that would be. And so um, we recommend it, but do not uh, require it. 
So um, enough about uh, radiation. Um, there uh, is actually um, a tremendous amount of interest and uh, large uh, uh, phase two trials uh, looking at uh, cryoablation and CTLA-4 blockade. And um, some of the, the initial work um, uh, illustrating the, um, the success of this approach uh, was performed by Rebecca Waits at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, along with Larry Norton, in which um, the combination of cryoablation in a mouse with anti-CTLA-4 um, antibody uh, demonstrated a significant uh, decrease um, in tumor growth um, in a mouse. And so um, these are the results where you can see uh, this, the effect of this combination treatment on the tumor-free survival um, compared to the control or cryotherapy or anti-CTLA-4 alone. So this, you know, this is very analogous um, to the results you see with the combination of radiation with um, anti-CTLA-4 only uh, rather than radiation, um, uh, we are using uh, cryotherapy here at that local technique. Dr. MacArthur um, conducted uh, the very first pilot study uh, demonstrating the feasibility and safety of uh, ipilimumab uh, with cryoablation, with or without cryoablation uh, in uh, breast cancer patients. And so you can see a tumor here um, that is pretreatment um, and, and is present in the uh, posterior upper uh, breast. And this is the ice ball uh, that uh, is formed after cryotherapy. And I'm told that um, there's a, a thawing that occurs prior to freezing again, uh, which all happens within a number um, of minutes. And uh, the size of this um, ball can be controlled by the interventional radiologist who performs the procedure. Um, but this is generally um, how it's done. And, um, and uh, from this study, uh, which is published, which was published in 2016, um, you can see that uh, this, uh, per, uh, this uh, percent chi 67 expression um, demonstrates uh, how the induction of systemic T cell proliferation um, was uh, induced by the combination of IPI plus cryo uh, compared to either uh, modality alone. So um, it is from these um, early preclinical as well as clinical studies here uh, that really led to the next generation of IO cryoablation studies. Great. Um, fantastic. Thanks so much, uh, Alice, for that uh, really exciting direction radiation is taking. Um, and we hope, we hope to see some of these data in the near future. So now I think it'd be a good time to have a, a bit of a discussion or to sort of maybe address some of the uh, questions that are coming in uh, from our audience. Heather, maybe you can uh, answer this question. How different has been the experience of uh, immune-related adverse events in the advanced setting where patients have been getting uh, immunotherapy as standard of care versus what's being reported uh, in the uh, neoadjuvant trials? That's a good question, George. The, I think the experience has been pretty consistent. Um, again, in the metastatic setting, um, the median survival for that um, PDL1 positive subset who received pembrolizumab, for example, was approximate was over two years. Um, so um, that's the duration of treatment there. In the Kino 522, it was a total year exposure. So in both experiences, um, they're getting long durations of treatment, and that's why I think understanding toxicity and the and the risk benefit calculation around efficacy versus toxicity is critically important. Um, but very consistent, the thyroid issues that we'll talk about um, today are the most common uh, side effects that we see um, in in the form of immune related adverse events, um, and the others, fortunately, are much less common. Um, that's with PD-1, PD-L1 directed therapy, which is mostly what we um, are talking about here today. With the CTLA-4 directed therapies, there are more issues with diarrhea and even colitis, especially in the early days. Um, so vigilance and early detection 
of immune related adverse events is critically important. And I, I think it's important for this audience specifically to, um, to be aware that immune related adverse events can happen even up to a year after the last exposure. So someone who received immune therapy on a neoadjuvant uh, research regimen who comes to you with routine follow-up a year later, complaining of profound fatigue, might actually be experiencing a delayed immune-related adverse event. So vigilance as a community, a multidisciplinary community, is critically important. So, uh, so you mentioned what's what's commonly seen are these endocrinopathies. Um, and fortunately, some of the more severe uh, side effects like the colitis uh, is, is less common. And I think that even less common are the severe cases of inflammation like in the heart and the lungs um, and, and in the liver. Uh, but the endocrinopathies seem to be uh, fairly prevalent. And um, this, I think, was, was manifested in, in uh, the neoadjuvant trials. Now, what what I think is interesting to talk about is the thyroid, uh, but also um, the uh, issues with the adrenal insufficiency, um, particularly in the surgical setting. Um, if these endocrinopathies might happen at the point of the neoadjuvant phase, it might impact the safety of surgery. Certainly, uh, the last thing you want to do is take one somebody to the operating room to have a bilateral mastectomy and a flap if they're adrenally insufficient. So what, what kind of things do you, do you imagine would be used to kind of screen for these toxicities? Do you think there should be screening? Is this something surgeons should be aware of potentially? Yeah, I think fortunately adrenal insufficiency and severe complications such as those are fortunately extremely rare. In the ISPY2 neoadjuvant study that we touched on briefly, there was a much higher reported rate of adrenal insufficiency than what has been seen in other studies. So it's still unclear to us as a community why that aberrancy occurred in that study specifically. Um, for patients who are being treated on study, we do do a battery of uh, baseline tests, including thyroid studies um, and, uh, and other related um, um, studies in anticipation of immune related adverse events and, and follow those serially while on study. I think the thyroid being the most common issue, so hypothyroidism being the most common endocrinopathy that can occur in you know, 15 to 18% of patients, um, that vigilance around that would be critically important, hyperthyroid less commonly. And fortunately, as I said, everything else is relatively uncommon. Most of the toxicity that was seen in the Keynote 522 study came from the chemotherapy and not the immune therapy which is somewhat reassuring, but certainly vigilance is key. I don't think that we have a standard panel of tests yet um, to recommend for baseline screening or serial surveillance, um, but certainly um, thyroid and, um, and uh, CMP profiles, which is what we do pretty routinely in our patients would be, would be warranted, but we need more longer term follow-up. We need more data about the delayed um, toxicities as well to better understand how best um, to survey these patients while they're on treatment. There's also a predictable, um, there's also a predictable pattern somewhat um, to immune related adverse events. Although that being said, the timing is highly variable. Here's a schema. You can see that rash can occur very early on, even after the first dose followed by diarrhea and then endocrine issues, as you can see, tend to be more delayed, followed by hepatitis and pneumonitis. Um, so again, these issues can happen even after surgery has occurred and are more likely to occur afterward than prior to surgery for most patients. Um, here are some more questions that just came in. Uh, what is the smallest size of TNBC to give neoadjuvant treatment uh, for resected 1.3 centimeter TNBC, does the type of chemo matter? Uh, well, I think that that is probably a little bit off topic, but one thing that that brings up, which is interesting is, does the backbone of chemotherapy matter, right? And so 522 included uh, carbo, which not everyone gives in, in, in every situation. And so 
there is this idea that some chemotherapies may be more immunogenic than others, um, but that seems a, a little bit uh, unclear at this point in time. So I think uh, that that probably will will be important to kind of hash out, or will it ever be hashed out? Do you think, or is this something that will be user dependent? I can, I don't foresee there ever being a study that randomizes patients to different chemotherapy backbones with immune therapy. And in fact, I think what would be more interesting would be um, treatment optimization strategies. So for those who are going to benefit from immune therapy, can you actually de-escalate or dial down some of the chemotherapy backbone? Um, but I don't think that there will be any head-to-head -head comparisons of chemotherapy with immune therapy in the curative intense setting, because that would probably be a tens of thousands of patient experience to tease out any difference. Yeah. The next question is, are TILs ready for clinical uh, use and patient stratification? And I, I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say that that is as of yet not ready. Uh, we don't we don't really have enough data to guide therapy uh, with TILs. In, for immunotherapy, it's not uh, as good as a biomarker as we need it to be uh, to select patients. Um, I think though it is hypothesis generating in terms of figuring out why do some patients have TILs and others don't and what you can do to sort of make a uh, cold tumor more immunogenic by increasing the TILs. Uh, so I don't think it's ready for clinical use. I do think it's ready for clinical trial use. And so this could be uh, a, a, a factor that could be looked at in the future for either de-escalation therapy, if in fact TILs do um, identify a group of people that have a better natural history, and maybe we can de-escalate things like chemotherapy. Um, so, so not ready for prime time, I think, for clinical use, but for, for trial use, I think it, there, it is a useful factor. And as I think you pointed out, George, till, the presence of TILs actually predicts for response to any kind of therapy. So not just immune therapy, but also chemotherapy and HER2-directed therapy in our HER2-positive patients. So um, I, th I absolutely agree that there's much more that we need to understand and probably better understanding all the other elements in the microenvironment will be critically important. Yeah. Next question, who is doing the cryotherapy? Uh, the surgeon and the radiologist. Uh, so as far as I'm aware, it's the, for breast, it's been the interventional radiologist, at least at our institution here uh, at Memorial. Has that been your uh, experience as well? In the clinical trials that we've undertaken combining immune therapy with cryoablation, the cryoablation has been performed by uh, interventional radiologists, as you stated, although I'm finding that surgeons are increasingly interested in adopting cryoablation into their practices. And so I think that this will be a fluid model. It's worth noting that in the trials that Alice discussed, combining cryotherapy with immune therapy, um, it, the, the aim isn't to try and replace surgery, and the aim isn't to try and do a complete ablation of the entire tumor. It's just to break it down into pieces, enough pieces that can be more easily digested by the immune system. So I think it is a strategy that could be adopted more broadly, but at this time being performed on study by interventional radiology. Right. The timing, I think, is, uh, is a very interesting question. And uh, that one arm of the Jepar Nuevo trial is very intriguing. And uh, some of the preclinical conceptual data that I had mentioned, uh, you know, maybe, maybe is suggestive that that isn't a fluke. It actually is real. Uh, the idea that you can have um, purposeful immuno editing of a tumor that can select out chemo resistant clones or just in general, make tumors simpler so that chemotherapy has a better shot of working, I think is, is, uh, is, is interesting. And hopefully it'll be explored more in the future. Do you know of, of various run-in trials that are ongoing? I don't. Well, that's how we conducted our cryoablation trials actually was yeah. giving immune therapy prior to the cryoablation for that exact reason. Um, and worth noting that in the initial ipilimumab cryoablation trial, 
that no recurrences have been reported after more than five years of follow-up, including in our triple negative breast cancer patients. So we're very encouraged by those results. And we have incorporated that same run-in strategy into the larger randomized phase two studies that Alice also described. Great. The uh, Cedars-Sinai preoperative PEMBRA radiation trial, as I recall, um, also started with the single cycle of PEMBRO and then added the radiation on to the subsequent cycle. And so that'll also be very nice from the standpoint that you know, you'll have these serial biopsies from pretreatment to post-PEMBRO and then the addition of radiation to the PEMBRO. Great, well, uh, thank you. This has been an incredible uh, discussion and, and, and some really great talks. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.